It's a great day to have you guys join us for another discussion of investing and putting your money to work for you. And this morning, before we get started, I need to give you all the disclaimers to make sure that you understand the risk that's out there for you. Let's look at this real quickly. Um, make it big for you to read here. Uh, if you wish to remain um, unidentified during the recording time, please um, remove your name and your face from the view. There are no crystal balls. Nothing's going to be perfect in life. And so uh, that's what risk about. These are strictly uh, my opinions, So you don't have to agree with them. And they are not factual pieces of data. Almost today, you can wonder if there is anything factual because everybody argues about everything. So one more thing that is not uh, more than just an opinion. Uh, the content provided here is just for your general information. It's not specific recommendations. Uh, these are the thoughts and opinions of Gimbal Financial and not necessarily those of LPL Financial. Securities offered through uh, by Gimbal or through LPL Financial, which is a member of FINRA and CIPIC. Uh, investment advice offered through Gimbal Financial. Uh, we are a registered investment advisor, separate and completely distinct from LPL Financial. We are two different entities. We are a much greater entity in my opinion, but that again is just an opinion. Hope you all are doing well today. It is uh, uh, so good to, to be with you. I uh, wanna go through some different ideas with you. And uh, um, I thought we would do a step back this week instead of talking specifically about the stock market before you can really invest in the stock market, you need some money to invest. And that's what I thought I might talk about a little bit is where do you get that money to invest? And um, I think you can start investing probably with as little as 500 or $1,000. And so how you do that is you save that money any way you can. Depending on uh, what your age is or what your situation is, you know, that may be a far stretch for you or may not be anything for you. But if it is a uh, far stretch for you, um, some simple things you can do is to cut back on spending or to go out and find some part time work to get that money to invest. I uh, started saving when I was about eight or 10 years old. I shoveled driveways, raked leaves, delivered newspapers, all kinds of creative things. And those things are available to you today to do different things as well. If you're a young person, you could volunteer, go door to door and show people how to disconnect from their, um, their uh, uh, cable TV. If they're still on the cable TV, you could hook them up with Wi-Fi. You could do a lot of things with your technology that they may not understand how to do and you can offer that at a reasonable rate and come up with the money you need to invest. And as you have that money to invest, then you need to think, what is it that I need to do with that money? And let me just show you some thoughts here real quick. Let me make sure I've got uh, the right screen here for you. I, um, uh, did a uh, analysis of the idea of being a bank here. Let me see if I can find that document. I call this document Think Like a Banker, and I'm going to share this with you because uh, the bankers don't like to lose money and and you need to think like a banker to come up with money to get to invest for you so hopefully you can see this if you can't see this um, uh, make a shout out to me and tell me you can or can't see it but there's really two ways that a banker operates they're a lender or they're a um, um, investor and so when they uh, lend to you, they are um, giving money to you at a fixed interest rate as an investor or they're borrowing from you, not an investor or a borrower. If they're borrowing from you, they're paying you interest to use your money for a period of time. And so, so they're a borrower or a lender. So 
on the left hand side of the screen, you can see their role as a borrower. You are the saver on this instance here. So the, the, the banker will borrow money from you in a savings account anywhere from 0.01% a year to 0.7% a year. That's what I could find this morning on a brief, brief review of the uh, internet. And so for every thousand dollar borrowed, they're borrowing that from you. You're the lender when you put money in your savings account. They're gonna pay you somewhere between 10 cents or $7 a year to borrow your $1,000. You all right with that? That's a savings account. If you could go out there with your $1,000 and dream up someplace where you could find 1% a year, they're gonna pay you $10 to borrow that $1,000. Then if you could somehow find some place where they would give you 2% today, they would pay you $20 a year to borrow your $1,000. And finally, if there was some extremely risky thing out there that they would um, borrow your money and pay you 10% a year for, you would get $100 a year from the bank. Okay, that's what they're gonna pay you uh, as they're the borrower. You're, you're the lender in that scenario. Whenever you put money in your savings account or any kind of savings, you're the lender in that situation. On the other side of the coin, when you borrow money from the bank, you're the borrower and they're the lender. And I went through and found different interest rates there on different situations. The, the average credit card interest rate today is $16, a signature loan. Back in the day, you didn't have to have what's called collateral. Like, um, I, you know, I might give you my phone uh, for some money temporarily as collateral. I'm giving you that for, to assure that you get your money back and I get my phone back. Well, there's a kind of loan that didn't require collateral and that's called a signature loan. And it, a signature loan was based on the idea that your um, integrity was enough and that your signature, because of who you are is valuable, um, was enough to get money from a bank. And so there was no collateral, it's just your integrity. And those loans are uh, at about 6% today. A car loan where you borrow money to buy a car is about 3%. And uh, college loans are on about 5%. And a home mortgage, as crazy as it sounds, are about 2%. The lower two there, the car loan and the home mortgage, the reason those rates are lower than some of the others is that there is an asset that guarantees part of that payment back. If you borrow money for a house, the bank has ownership of that house until you pay it off. And so they're willing to give you an, a lower interest rate because it's not just the risk of your integrity. They got a physical asset for the, which they can sell to get their money back. Same thing with the car. There's a car that can uh, be sold to get back part of their loan value. The car loan, um, t the tendency is as a car is depreciating in value, whereas a house might go up in value. So that's why those two interest rates are a little bit Different. There's more risk on general for a car loan than a, than a house loan to the banks. But if you look at those uh, with a credit card, the average, if you carry a balance there, they're going to charge you $160 a year, which is 60% more than the risky rate of 10% that I showed you over on the other side of the equation there. If you could lend the bank money and somehow get 10% on your money, um, that the credit card is giving the bank even a lot higher interest rate than that um, amount that you could get from a risky rate of return. Uh, signature loans give them 60, car loans, the college loans 30 and 50, and then finally the mortgage is $20 off that same $1,000 that you would borrow. Um, then, then if you can kind of compare the difference there, suppose you put money in a savings account and got 0.1% and they're turning around and lending it out across the page there at that 6%, they're getting $60 <clears throat> by loaning you, paying you 10 cents. That's a pretty good return on their investment there, don't you think? And so as you're considering life decisions and trying to figure out how to invest, one of the best places you can invest is over here if you have any of these loans outstanding over here, is to try to take your savings and plow it over here so that you actually um, 
are making money in a risk-free manner. The, taking money that you have in the bank and you're only getting seven dollars a year and putting in that money towards your credit card that's paying sixteen percent, you're going to save yourself nine percent. Uh, well, no, you're going to save yourself fifteen percent a year, or one hundred and fifty-three dollars a year. Uh, by paying a thousand dollars out of your savings account towards your credit card, that is a that is a risk free transaction there, and and that's a great way to become a great investor from your curiosity is to get rid of you want to you want to quit giving the bank this money you want to be a bad customer to the bank because the bank is always going to make money on this side. And then you want to figure out, once you get rid of all this over here, you want to figure out how do I take the money that's on here and try to get a little higher rate of return. And so if I can encourage you as curious investors today, how to excel with your money, the goal is to minimize the amount of annual interest you're paying over here on the right side. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, any questions on this before I move on? All right, well thanks. I'm gonna bring up another screen here. I follow a number of investors on um, Twitter and those investors, uh, again, don't necessarily, I'm not endorsing what they say or do, um, but I just saw this this week uh, uh, from an investor named Mark Minervini. He said, odds, I want to get paid interest. He's saying he doesn't want to pay interest, just what I showed you, he wants to get paid interest. And if I understand right, this car on the right here is a Lamborghini. Maybe you all know that car better than I do, but that's a Lamborghini. And this car on the left is, a, I think it's a Mercury, which I think is part of Ford, is a Mercury Lynx, L-Y-N-X. And uh, the Lynx could be one of the ugliest cars ever, I'm not sure. But part of the way that Mark Minervini explains here in this tweet of how he had investment success was that he drove this car, this Mercury Lynx, many years longer than he probably needed to, to, to do so. I think what I read about him is he wanted to have a million dollars of investments before he would buy a new car. He might buy a new used car. I'm not sure exactly his car history, but he wanted to have that money to invest. And so one of the ways he figured out how to have money to invest was not spend it on cars. And once he became very proficient and um, excellent in his investments, he then went from the Mercury Lynx at some point to the Lamborghini. Both of those were cars he drove. So very interesting idea, very interesting picture there. Um, and my own story, uh, I saw this and I thought this was beautiful. He, uh, this says worst car, Chevy, Chevy Lumina. And um, this car is the one I drove as a younger dad. And the, I picked this color because it's the one we had. And it, it just could be one of the ugliest cars ever. One of my coworkers started working with us when, we, um, when I was driving this. And he was just really curious whether I was even going to be able to make payroll because the thing looked so dumpy. But it got me from point A to point B. And I was able to um, go about life saving money so I'd have money to invest and to have greater returns later. And I didn't really care what anybody thought about the car that I was driving. So that, that was my Mercury Lynx. It was a Chevy Lumina. So let's see uh, if we can't maybe find some math along the lines of cars too. I'm gonna find another sheet I had for you here. 
Okay. All right. Now, think about <clears throat> the money you're going to pay for a car. And let's just use an example. What I did here is I said I just went out to Facebook Marketplace to see what kind of cars are available out there and what you can do and get a car that'll get you from point A to point B. You could probably get a decent car that's going to last you four or five years for $3,000 today. And, and that is generally beneath a culture that thinks they deserve things. But if you look at the Minervini example I showed you earlier, that you take an attitude that I don't want my money going to a place that's depreciating, but I'm going to try to figure out how to get my money to appreciate. Then you try when you're younger to spend as much money as possible. Uh, on appreciating assets and as little as possible on depreciating assets. And so a car is amongst the fastest of depreciating assets and a depreciating means the value goes down and down and down. And so I took the idea and I started year one here with buying a car for $3,000. And then in my thought process over here, I said, I'm going to depreciate this and say it drops in value by 10% every single year that I'm going to lose 10% a year on this car value. So I start with 3000. And then I said, you know, had I tried to get a nicer car instead of the one I got, what if I paid $300 a month or $3,600 a year in a car payment? So I'm not yet, I don't have a car payment, but I'm thinking I want to pay cash for my cars. I don't want to be, lending i don't want to be a borrower to the bank because i see how they win that game but i want to be a man or woman that buys my cars on a cash basis and most people don't do this most people borrow money to buy cars which uh, is a really silly process because you're losing money and you don't have the money to begin with to lose and so your your value is quickly depreciating and dropping and so what I said here is you're going to save $3,600 or that $300 a month car payment. You're going to pay $500 a year in maintenance where that's oil changes, other things that break down. And, and so that's, that's even, you know, some people say don't do that. That's more than 10% of the value of your car. I'm saying consider doing it. So, so you're saving that $3,600 a year, but we have to take the 500 out to pay for the, um, um, maintenance. So it, at the end of the year, I'm really only saving $3,100 because I'm paying 500 in maintenance. I'm losing $300 of value. So the ending value of my car is $2,700. Okay. You with me so far? So the beginning of year two, we're going to start with a $2,700 car. We're going to save another 3,100. So at the end of that year, we're going to have $6,200 in our savings. Uh, we're going to have the maintenance and depreciation. Depreciation isn't going to be as much money because it's a smaller value that's depreciating. And then, uh, and then the ending value of the car over here, you can kind of follow the ending value of the car is, is declining on a regular basis. So your, your car at the end of five years has nearly dropped in half. Maybe it has dropped in half. It's probably about ready to fall apart, but if you put $2,500, these $500 a year of maintenance expenses in there, you've probably taken pretty good care of that thing and, and it, it's gonna do just fine. And so what happened with this process where you paid yourself your car payment, at the end of five years, you're gonna have $15,500 in savings and a residual value of just, just say $1,500 for your car. 1500 on top of the 15.5 is $17,000. And if we were to go out on the internet and say, what could I buy today with $17,000? You're gonna get a pretty nice car. And, and if you repeated the same process um, for uh, five more years, you're gonna have a $20, $25,000 car in 10 years from now that you paid cash for with only paying a $300 a month car payment to yourself. 
this isn't guaranteed because there's things that can change. You can, you can buy a bad car, or you could get a little impatient and kind of start the thing over at year three or whatever, but it's a much better strategy for managing your money, making your money, your servant, rather you becoming the servant of your things. And so this strategy is opposite of what most people do. Most people, when they get, they're paying this car payment, they would have paid, say they would have paid this 15.5 up front, that 15.5 car is depreciating, so it's gonna be worth 7,500 down here, and they're not gonna have any money at savings at the end when they're done with that five years. And so um, the, the process of doing something this way versus the way other people do it will put you in a much greater financial situation. You're gonna have a lot more peace about your finances than if you didn't buy, if you bought the car to begin with. So th this week, I just wanted to talk to you about having some capital to invest, some simple principles that everybody has to do in life that has a car, and how you can take advantage of the system. One of my clients who's been a client for many, many years, she had advice for young ladies that were dating, and she's in her, I think in her late 80s now, and she said, Keith, I used to always tell the young girls, don't go for the guy with the shiny car. Go for the guy with the banger car, the old beat up car, because he's got a big checkbook or savings account in the uh, glove compartment of that thing. And so it's kind of counterintuitive. The shinier the car, probably the bigger the loan balance is. And the more scuffed up the car, maybe there's a chance it's a bigger savings account. Well, that's what I've got for you today. If there's, are there any questions before I close out today's show? All right. Well, I am thankful you joined us this week. Um, next week, we're going to talk about tennis balls and eggs and what that has to do with your investing. Tennis balls and eggs is